Hello everyone. Welcome to our third episode on our life group study on the book of Acts. Today we're going to be in chapter 1 verses 12 to 26. In the last episode we covered the ascension of Jesus and we left off with the disciples looking up into the heavens where Jesus had been concealed by a cloud. And then two angels appeared and announced to them that Jesus would return one day in the same way. But where did this happen? And what happened afterwards? Well, Luke tells us in detail, and he reinforces what Trevor told us in episode one, that Luke was a remarkable historian. So what I'd like you to do is to follow the instructions on the screen, um, beginning by reading the text together. Welcome back. Well, here are some examples of Luke's attention to detail. In a single verse, we learn that the ascension happened on the Mount of Olives, but that wasn't specific enough for Luke. So he tells us that it was a Sabbath day's journey away. The Jews had a certain distance that they were allowed to travel on, a, on the Sabbath. If they traveled more than that, it was considered to be work. And that distance was in the region of 1,100 meters. So the ascension happened about 1,100 meters away from Jerusalem. You can't get more specific than that. So it was on the slopes of the Mount of Olives between Jerusalem and Bethany. Bethany was about three and a half kilometers from Jerusalem. That's the place where Lazarus lived with his two sisters, Mary and Martha. And then we learn that they went to the upper room where they were staying. And then he tells us who they were. He gives the names of the remaining 11 apostles. And then he tells us what they were doing, devoting themselves in one accord to prayer. And then he tells us who they were joined by, the woman, possibly the apostles' wives. Uh, we know that they did have wives. Paul refers to them in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 5 and then Mary, the mother of Jesus. And incidentally, this is the last mention of her in Scripture. So we ask ourselves the question, why so much detail? And it doesn't stop here. I mean, for example, he gives us the names of the field where Judas died, Akeldama. Then he provides a translation for his Gentile readers. It was known as the field of blood. And I believe that Luke's intention was to show that the story was not some sort of a fable that was concocted or a legend to teach us something about God, but rather it was a verifiable account of something that actually happened. In the words of Paul, quoted by Luke later in Acts, the king, referring to King Agrippa, knows about these things. What happened in Jerusalem at that time was common knowledge to everybody. And to him I speak boldly, for I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. This happened in Jerusalem, and many, many people knew about it and heard about it. And so if there had been any discrepancy between Luke's account and what actually happened, then one would have expected objections to have lasted along with the Bible. But of course, there were no objections and there are no objections. And then in verse 15, Luke moves the narrative on to the next event of consequence, namely the replacement of Judas. And the players involved are Peter, the other apostles and the brothers, roughly 120 people altogether. Some more detail. When did this happen? It happened in those days. And from the context, we know that this is the period between Jesus's ascension on the one hand and the day of Pentecost on the other. Now, let's explore this account of Judas's replacement and see what we can learn about the apostles, first of all, and secondly, about how they decided to replace Judas. And I think it's quite interesting, the process that they went through in making their decision. And I think that we can learn from that how to make decisions ourselves as well. So first of all, 
the apostles. I've divided what we learn about the apostles into three things, or three categories, their names, their ministry, and their uniqueness. Their names, their ministry, and their uniqueness. Let's begin with their names. Verse 12 begins, then they, who are they? Well, it's clear that they were the apostles, and then their names are given in verse 13. I'm not going to say much more about this, but at this stage there were 11 apostles because Judas Iscariot, rather than Judas the son of James, was now dead. What about the ministry? Well, I'd like you to pause and follow the instructions on your screen. Welcome back. In verse 22, Paul sums up the ministry of an apostle as being a witness to Jesus' resurrection. And this is exactly what Jesus said in verse 8. He said, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The primary function of an apostle was to be a witness, a witness on behalf of Jesus Christ. And the word apostle means one who is sent out. So they were sent out by Jesus to bear testimony to what they had seen and learnt. So Jesus was sending out the apostles to be his witnesses, meaning first and foremost, as we saw earlier uh, in verse 22, uh, witnesses to his resurrection. What about their uniqueness? If we read in verses 21 and 22, so one of the men who had accompanied, I beg your pardon, one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us. One of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. So if you could just stop and answer the next question that is going to appear on your screen. Welcome back. Well, here are some of the things that we learn about the uniqueness of the apostles. First of all, they lived with Jesus, witnessing what he did and what he said. The candidate would be drawn from one of the men who accompanied us. That is, he lived and traveled with Jesus and the 12 apostles every day. What's the period that's in view? Well, to begin with, to begin with, it was during all the time that the Lord went in and out among us. It makes it pretty clear. And Luke uses that phrase, went in and out, in chapter 9, verse 28, to describe Paul. And he uses it to refer to Paul's public ministry in Jerusalem after his conversion. So when he says during the time that the Lord went in and out amongst us, he's referring to the time that Jesus spent ministering publicly. Then Luke gives more detail about the period, namely it's the period from when Jesus was baptized by John to the day of Jesus' ascension. And the significance of that qualification is that the person chosen would have been a witness of everything that Jesus did and taught during his ministry before crucifixion and of what he did and taught after his resurrection. They would have been witnesses to both before and after. Then the next unique thing about the apostles is that they were chosen and called by Jesus in person. And folks, it's my opinion um, that this explains the method the disciples used to choose a replacement for Judas Iscariot. Although they were involved in the process, in that we read 
they put forward two possible candidates that fulfilled the criteria for an apostle, the ultimate choice was left to Jesus by casting lots, effectively flicking a coin up, seeing whether it was heads or tails. Uh, just have a look at verses 24 to 26 there. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, know the hearts of all. Show us which one of these two you have chosen. They were asking Jesus to make the choice. Um, verse 25, to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And then we see that immediately they cast lots for them and the lot fell on Matthias and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. From these criteria, we can see that the office of apostle was given to the 12 and Paul only. These were what we might call foundational apostles. And as Trevor said in episode one, these apostles, foundational apostles, laid a foundation for each generation of Christians to build on. And we can see this in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 to 21. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Here it comes built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. So we've learned something about the 12 apostles today. We've learned their names, their ministry, and their qualifications. Let's have a look at how they decided to replace Judas Iscariot. So at this stage, I'd like you to just pause the video. Um, there will be some instructions on your screen. Please follow those. Welcome back. The first thing that Peter does is to frame the issue considering Scripture. He wants to see this issue. He wants to interpret what's going on through the lens of Scripture. He wants to get a biblical perspective on what is happening. And Luke, very interestingly, being the historian he is, and for reasons we've already explored, um, adds some editorial historical details. Let's just have a quick look at those first. Verse 18, Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. Ugh. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language Akeldama, that is, field of blood. Just take a moment to read Matthew 27, 3 to 10 together. I'll put the reference up there on the screen and we'll be back together in a few moments. Well, I hope you um, were able to read that. So putting today's passage together with Matthew 27, 3 to 10, we learn that the reward referred to in verse 18 was 13 pieces of, I beg your pardon, 30 pieces of silver, given by the chief priests and the elders. And Peter tells us in verse 16 that Judas became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. He knew where Jesus went. Uh, he knew his favorite spots. So his job was to take the soldiers to arrest Jesus at some time when the crowds wouldn't witness it so that there wouldn't be um, any sort of a, an uproar or an uprising. And the money was Judas's reward for doing exactly that. And then Luke is being concise when he writes that Judas acquired a field. Um, what, he, what he does is he actually consolidates the steps of returning the money to the chief priests and elders, um, which was then used by them to buy the potter's field. So because he's you know, short on space, he just um, brings it all together, summarizes it. And then Matthew records that Jesus hanged himself on the potter's field which was renamed the field of blood. But Luke says he, he fell headlong. 
burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. Um, and this probably happened when his body was in an advanced state of decay, either falling to the ground by itself, wh where he'd hung himself, or whilst they were cutting him down from the rope. But however it happened, Luke recorded these details because they could have been verified by witnesses, people who, who had been there. So we've looked at the historical details. Now let's see how Peter um, goes about framing this particular issue um, in Scripture and with the consideration of Scripture. So verse 16, he says, Brothers, the Scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. And then in verse 20, he's explaining this now, for it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it and let another take his office. So the Holy Spirit um, helped Peter to understand this particular issue that they were facing from a biblical perspective. Certain Psalms and, and were to be understood as messianic psalms. In other words, what happened in the psalmist's experience was typical of the experiences of the Messiah and actually foreshadowed what the Messiah would go through. And so Peter quotes two psalms, and maybe at one stage you can go back um, and read these uh, later on in the week. Psalm 69 verse 25 and Psalm 109 verse 8. So folks, when we need to decide on a complex issue, and we want to do so in a godly way, we must find out what Scripture says about the issue. That's the lesson that we learn here. But there's more. We need to seek God in prayer. Verse 14 records that the apostles were devoting themselves to prayer. And then more specifically in verse 24, it records that they prayed and they said, You, Lord. So prayer was involved. So we need to get a, a scriptural perspective on what is involved, view things through the lens of scripture, because then we'll be seeing things the way God sees them, um, taking his advice, if you like, uh, as we make our decisions. Secondly, we must pray. And then lastly, we should involve others that are infected. <laughs> Not infected, affected. <laughs> so, yeah, it's always good to remember that we... Um, are in a family and there are brothers and sisters in Christ who can help us when we're making difficult decisions and especially if those decisions involve them. I mean I'm thinking for example in my own marriage if there's a decision that involves Gail and I and when Catherine and Matthew were at home um, Gail and I would be praying about it we'd, but we'd, we'd talk about it all together we'd, we'd make decisions together. So Peter um, involves others in the process, and in this case, the brothers, a group of about 120 people. He, he, number one, stood up among the brothers, and he addressed them, that's in verse 15, and then two, as a group, they put forward two candidates, verse 23, and lastly, three, they prayed. Let's just talk briefly about casting lots, um, and whether that's a good way to be making decisions. Well, Trevor explained in episode one that the things recorded in Acts may be placed in one of three categories. Um, things that were unique, in other words, they're once off, they only happened on those occasions in the early church. Two, those that are repeated throughout history, but only at very special times and in special places. And then three, things that we can expect to be the normal experience of Christians, normative. So casting lots, I think, um, goes into category one or possibly category two. I, th I think, it, personally, I believe it was unique. Um, it was the apostle's way of saying um, an apostle needs to be chosen by Jesus. And so we're giving you the choice, Lord Jesus, by casting lots. And this is certainly not a normative way of making decisions. So just in conclusion, um, I'd like you to, to stop the video and take some time to allow each person in the group to share something of take home value with the rest of the group. 
and um, and also what well, specifically something of take home value that you would like to apply in your life and so I'll leave you to do that and uh, we'll be joining together again Trevor will be taking episode four and then I'll be seeing you for episode five five thank you so much for joining us and we'll we'll see you later on goodbye for now